And that should let the yep. attendees come. Cool. Hey, Anita. I think you should be able to chat if you'd like to say anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we are having this seminar today. And uh, especially those who have questions over and beyond what they ask their school counselors, uh, you know, they can always ask because many times the school counselors are only towards, a, you know, a particular level, right? If, you, if you're looking at uh, specific colleges, uh, you know, you can always have specific questions answered. Sometimes they don't get answered in a common, you know, 500 parent forum, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad that uh, we're putting this together. This is pretty exciting. Um, right. Hopefully we can make it a repeat event. I know we talked about doing some other topics as well. So glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to be here as well. And I've turned on the, the Q&A mode that people right. should be able to submit their questions. Um, but there's also the, the chat, but I think probably the Q&A will be easier. Right. And we have plenty of time after the presentation to hang out and chat. So. Mm, yeah, 7.30, okay. I'm just trying. So I'll probably wait five minutes or so. Yeah. Ready to pop in, get settled, finish up dinner. Yeah. Q&A is already open. I'm just putting it uh, to all the parents, you know, so that they can Chat not open. Um, panel attendees. Here we go. Got it. Thank you, Chris. I think it should be open now. Do you see it? Yeah. I ask people. Anybody wants to ask any questions? Um, see that in the chat but i did change it so yeah, questions should be put in the q a that'll yes. make it much easier much yes. much easier yeah. yeah okay okay my first question maybe question um oh what are the parameters different to get into IB League? Yeah, we're certainly gonna cover all that stuff. So yeah, while everybody is hanging out for a few more minutes, if you guys want to submit. Any questions that are on the top of your mind? Uh, I plan on covering sort of an overview of the process in terms of how selective colleges will be looking at students and kind of the, the big questions that they answer and what they overall will look for. Um, but I know there's a lot more that goes into this process. So I'm happy to answer questions on anything in the process. Um, so we'll kind of cover those kind of like what Anita just asked with what, what the different parameters are for selective colleges versus main ones. We'll talk mostly about that for maybe 30-ish minutes um, and then open it to all sorts of questions.
Okay. Ta 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 GPS. Those of you okay. just joining in, if you want to pop any of your questions into the Q&A, uh, we'll get to questions in the second half of the presentation, but just glad to have them here right now. Yeah. I'll wait a few, just another minute or so before beginning. Alrighty, well, I think I will go ahead and get started. Um, we got a little poll going just to gauge. Got lots of parents here, some students here. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining. Um, like I mentioned, we have the Q&A box open. Um, it's also the, the chat box if you, I guess, are having trouble with the Q&A box, but the chat is there as well. So lots of ways we can communicate. Um, Anita, were you planning on giving an introduction or I can just go ahead and start? Yeah, I, I, I can give an introduction if you want. Sure. Um, this is all your idea. To... Everybody can thank Anita for helping us put this together. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I know parents uh, always have questions on, uh, you know, how, uh, what, what are the parameters an admission officer looks at? And once I put uh, all the information on my common app, do they look at the essay or do they look at the brag sheet or the extracurriculars or the volunteering opportunities? What is actually really important? Uh, do I have to win a huge award in Model UN or is it okay for me to do what I'm passionate about in the community? Uh, how do I differentiate? I mean, because everybody's doing so many things. So, uh, I'm, and I approached Nikki because Nikki is very vocal and has done these seminars before. And she said, okay, let me come over and do a seminar and, you know, help put some doubts to rest. So thank you, Nikki, for stepping up to the plate and, you know, the podium is all yours. Thank you so much. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, like Anita said, I've been uh, working in college admissions for a while, and I know there are a lot of Edison's families in this presentation right now. So I used to live in Woodbridge, and I've worked with lots of Edison families over the years. So I understand um, the subtle differences between I know a lot of parents didn't go to college in the United States, so didn't quite understand exactly how it works. It's a little bit different than you might be used to. Um, but there, I know there are people from other towns here too. We also welcome you um, and all of your experiences. So like I've been saying, my goal today is to give you all just a bit of an overview of what more selective colleges are looking for. And it's kind of like, you know, when you shoot for the top, 
if you're qualified to get into a highly selective school, then, you know, your traditional medium to your school is going to be easy to get into. So, you know, I like to give you an overabundance of information, sort of this, you know, large goals to shoot for. Um, but by no means does this mean that your student has to go to a highly selective school to succeed, that they have to do all these crazy things in order to get into any college. Uh, there is a college for just about every student who desires to go to college. Um, so things like, uh, I, I get lots of questions about rankings and all that, and, and that is a kind of a separate conversation um, but that I would be glad to have with you. But I was thinking of doing another presentation on college list maybe later on. Um, so that could be maybe a good topic for us to discuss another time. But for this presentation, really, I just want to get into the main factors that college admissions college admissions committees are going to be considering with each student. So um, a little background on me and Princeton College Consulting. I've been working in education for over a decade now, been working with lots of students in lots of capacities, um, from a teacher to a tutor, doing lots of academic skills coaching and in college admissions realm as well, helping them develop lists, helping them develop their character, and that's kind of what we do here at Princeton College Consulting is we take students and we teach them all they need to know about being a standout student to get into colleges, help them figure out everything from what classes they should take, you know, summer programs, supporting them as they do individual projects, teaching them how to read, how to write, how to think. Um, so that's just sort of how we interact with families. Um, yeah. So again, if you have any questions, just pop them into the boxes and I'll kind of go through my presentation first and then we can get to the questions. So thank you all for coming. So the college admissions process, it's a character based evaluation for the most part. And that's what I mean when we talk about holistic admissions. Um, it looks at the whole student, the whole person. Right. So this day and age, um, more and more colleges, yes, they care about grades, they care about desk, test scores, right? And a bottom line, you have to meet a certain minimum, but it's not enough anymore. Like it used to be that you could get perfect scores on everything and take all the challenging classes and you're pretty much shoe in, you know, as long as you had some leadership experience he, here and there, but it's not so much like that anymore. Um, the character is based on more than just what you can show on a resume, but it's going to be about how a student really displays their motivations um, through topics or uh, through factors such as their essay, such as through the recommendation letters, and such as through what activities they decide to do. Um, is it just joining a club at their school or is it running an independent research project, right? Which projects are going to be the ones that show initiative and dedication um, and that they're really willing to maximize the opportunities that they have. So the more that a student can really dig into what really authentically interests them, right, what their true desires are, and then it doesn't have to be a specific job. I mean, we all know that teenagers, they'll change their mind. Not everybody knows what they want to be when they grow up. I'm sure a lot of you in this room still don't know what you want to be when you grow up, right? But having a particular interest set, right? Having a direction, you know, a student might know that they want to go into something in the healthcare field and might not know exactly what it is, but having that drive to really get out and explore and dig in and figure these things out, that really goes into the character. So overall, these are the factors that are considered and they all kind of blend into character. And I'm not gonna get into too, too much detail on each of them, kind of just give a quick overview. I think another presentation, we can go into more detail, but overall it's sort of split into two categories. We have what we call the numbers and then the personal traits. Um, so numbers are just what you would expect, right? Your GPA, if the school does rank, I know a lot of schools aren't really ranking anymore, but oftentimes in their school profile, they will publish, you know, here's the range of GPAs and how many students are in each particular range. So they can kind of figure out rank pretty roughly without an actual number. Um, test scores, uh, SAT subject tests, not really a thing anymore. Maybe there are a couple of students that still have those, but they got rid of those a few years ago. Um, the AP exam score is definitely going to be more relevant. And then the personal traits. And these are where I think a student has the most potential to differentiate themselves, right? So through what they actually participate in, how they participate, how they contribute, and how they write about themselves, how they speak about themselves in the interview. 
Um, and then that there's the VIP status sort of portion, which is a bit beyond this conversation as well. But, you know, if you happen to be a recruited athlete, that does help. But again, it's not if you're not an athlete, that doesn't mean you don't have a chance. Right. So that, that's more of the institutional priority side of things. Um, you know, there are certain schools that, that value things that are outside of a student's control, like socioeconomics as well. So that's sort of out of a student's control, but definitely interview letters of recommendation, you know, who they ask for those letters is really important and how they show up in the classroom is going to be really important and, and the essay. So that's where we have, you know, a bit more room to wiggle, I guess. And that's a lot of what I do as a counselor is really help to develop these, these personal traits because I can tell a student to study, I can teach a student to study, but ultimately it's on the student to do the studying. I can't be there making them do that. Right, but we can do practice interviews together, essentially. So, so overall, there are three key questions that I'm going to go through shortly, and these are the questions that college admissions committees are going to ask themselves when they're looking at your profile. Um, so, this sort of revolves around what you need to do and blends into what I was talking about. So, the first question focuses basically on what you do in the classroom. It's based primarily on the numbers, right? If we admit you, can you thrive academically? A college, especially a highly selective college, wants to know that you can actually handle the workload. Um, and that's not just college specific, but also if you're applying to a specific major, especially a highly competitive major like computer science or business um, or engineering. These are very highly competitive majors. So if there's a student who's applying to an engineering program at a college and their math scores are not that great, they're going to have a harder time getting in versus the same student applying to that same college under a different major, like a humanities major, maybe they want to study sociology, having not the best math scores isn't going to matter as much. Obviously, students should be passing, should be doing well, but, but this academic thriving will vary school to school, and it will vary program to program. So it's more about, has the student shown that they are in alignment with their goals, right? I mean, if you want to study English, then you should be good at English, right? Kind of pretty um, standard there. Um, but again, academics aren't the only way to stand out. You, you really can't differentiate yourself just based on these numbers. So there is a minimum threshold. And when we're talking about the highly selective colleges, uh, you know, 3.75, 3.8 and above, you're 1500 and above. I mean, there's a little bit of a minimum threshold and, there are students who get in below those thresholds, but they usually have something that really stands out about them. And that's when we go back to that VIP status. I and mean, you could probably get into a highly selective school as an athletic recruit with a 3.4, probably, right? But it really depends on those other factors. Um, but of course, right, the stronger your academics are, the stronger position you're in. So it, it really does add to the whole aspect, right? The holistic aspect of things. So that's our first question. Can you thrive academically? And something else to note with the with the numbers portion of this is if you are submitting a test score, right? Keep in mind, a lot of schools are test optional right now um, and a lot plan to remain test optional. Although like I know schools like MIT don't, a lot of Florida schools don't, um, oh, sorry, aren't test optional. They, they require it. There's also something to, to think about if there is a discrepancy. So let's say you have a low-ish GPA, um, you know, 3.1, 3.2, but a really, really, really high test score, you know, high 1500s, that could actually be a little, uh, it could throw the committee off a little bit. They could wonder, well, if you're so brilliant at math and reading that you got a really high score, why are your grades so low? Um, so that kind of bleeds into some of the other questions, but it's also something to think about that a lot of students I've worked with think that just because they got a good test score, that's going to make up for the fact that they didn't have a great GPA. And that's not necessarily the case, at least not for highly selective schools, right? So I see a couple people are raising hands. If you have questions, just pop them into the Q&A. Um, once I'm done breezing through this, I promise I will get to all of your questions. So I just want to keep the flow going here and give you the overall. So, so let's look at 
the next question. So, right, academically, you meet that minimum threshold, you're showing that you can take rigorous courses, succeed at them, that you're showing your objective knowledge through SAT scores, possibly if you're submitting them, right? So really decision gets made back around these character traits, which I discussed before. So the second question is everything you do outside of the classroom, right? So that's sort of the bottom half of this circle here, um, your resume. And remember, extracurriculars aren't just school clubs, right? It could be anything that you do that's outside of school, right? So it could be in your community, it could be nationally, like maybe you know or met a professor across the country and you're helping them with research, right? So it doesn't have to be anything school associated. Um, they look at outside things, inside things quite equally. It's just something else that you do. So this question really is about meaning. Are you going to do something meaningful with your life? And meaning can mean different things depending on the category, right? I mean, oftentimes it is how will you have a positive impact on others in the world? And that could be through the obvious things such as, you know, healthcare, people who want to become doctors, they want to help people or engineers, you want to create a new technology that will help solve a problem. But even artists, I think, um, you know, if you're a musician or a visual artist or theater, you know, what's meaningful for you and your particular track is going to be creativity and, you know, having a talent for immersing yourself and, and breaking the mold on different arts and providing entertainment and joy to people, right? Either way, we are still impacting others, whether it's solving a problem or providing something that will enhance their lives, right? And the definition of meaning is sort of up to each student, but what matters is, is, are they going out and are they doing these things right now? Because if right now you're doing meaningful things, and that tells a college that you will go on to do more meaningful things, that you're not going to stop all of a sudden, right? So this is about how you live your life, how you approach the things you do. And that's something that will be displayed, you know, through essays, through a resume. And, you know, how community oriented are you? Do you participate in your school? How do you help others? How do you show up? Or, you know, maybe you don't have the opportunity to participate in your community. Maybe you have to come home and take care of your siblings, right? But you do it every day diligently um, just because of family circumstances and still you're thriving, right? So it's not always about how much you can add to your resume, but it's how much meaning you can attach to it, how much impact you have with these activities. So they learn, committees learn from the depth of your experiences, right? So how far have you gone into what you're doing? Are you just a participant? Do you just show up to the weekly Wednesday meeting and eat pizza? Or are you an officer of the club? Are you creating new initiatives? Are you joining up with other clubs, outside organizations? Are you starting the fundraisers and doing the whole thing? You know, how much are you really putting into this versus just participating? And, and colleges have caught on to the people who just pad their resumes, who just join all these different clubs and maybe that don't even relate to each other, um, which, you know, there's nothing necessarily against that because there are students who have a wide variety of interests, right? But it still goes back to depth. I mean, if you're doing, if you're a musician and an athlete and a robotics kid, are you just participating on all of these things at surface level or are you really digging into each of these activities because it's truly a passion for you? right? So there's a subtle difference there, but it is something that the college committees can pick up on. So ultimately, you have to approach all your decisions, right, with, with care, but thoughtfully, right? Like knowing why you're doing something, who it's going to impact, why it's going to be meaningful, and really putting your best effort into it, right? Going above and beyond. And especially for the highly selective schools, you have to go above and beyond not just yourself, right, and get out of your comfort zone, but your peers, because it is a competitive process at the end of the day. Um, and in this presentation, I am going to go through a few case studies of students that we've worked with, because I'm sure you're itching for examples of what I mean by this. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but that's our second overall question, right? Are you going to do something meaningful with your life? So, right. So the first question was bare minimum, academics. Can you do the work here? And then are you going to do something meaningful with once you graduate? from college, right? Colleges, as much as you are investing in your education, they are investing in you. And they would love nothing more than a graduate of their university to go off and win a Nobel Prize and thank the university, right? I mean, their businesses too, they want that good PR. So that, that's a little bit in the back of their minds as well. 
Uh, so just a quick example here um, of, you know, meaningfulness. Um, here we have a couple of hypothetical students and, and what they're doing, right? They're pretty much identical. They're undecided on their major, so they're just applying to a school. And the first student does this internship at a university performing Alzheimer's research. The second student has a successful ice cream shop in their neighborhood. So which student do you think would be admitted to a selective university? Now, I'm venturing to guess that many of you would say student one. And student one definitely has done some really cool things. And in a way, I think that this is a very good opportunity that the student has had. And it might also depend a little bit on why they got into it. You know, was there a personal connection? Do they have a family member with Alzheimer's? How hard was it to get this internship? You know, did they have to email 100 professors? Did they, you know, really dig into a unique side of research? Are they really able to show how much effort went into this? Or is it like their uncle happened to be doing this research and they just went and shadowed them? So, you know, subtle differences there that can be explained on parts of the application. But I'm more likely to think that student two is going to be the one who gets that admit because it shows a lot more grit um, to do something that brand new, first of all, right? There wasn't an ice cream shop already. Um, in this day and age, they probably had to get a permit to have a shop, right? Um, they went out, they had the basic materials, they bought their cart, painted it, decorated it. Um, maybe they made their own ice cream. In fact, that would be another level of effort. You know, maybe they're designing new wild recipes and flavors. Um, you know, if they want to go the legal route, probably have to do some sort of health inspection. Right? There's a lot of barriers to entry. Essentially, the second student like created a business from scratch, right? From an idea, from something that they just wanted to do. They wanted to provide something for their community. Maybe they're using it as a way to raise funds for a nonprofit. Maybe a portion of their proceeds goes towards maybe Alzheimer's research, right? Uh, maybe it's the same student. I mean, I think if the student could do two, that'd be even more bonus. But, but the main point here is that it, one sounds like it looks good on a resume and that the colleges want, but what are the character traits being displayed here, right? One is that I can go in and I can do lab work and I can read and research stuff and I can write and another is I can get out of my comfort zone, build something from scratch and face adversity and challenge and be successful at. It. All right. The second one shows a lot more grit. The first one is looping into something that already exists. The second one is creating something new. And I think that's the biggest differentiator here. And, and what really sets these Ivy tier students apart is that they take the initiative to do something new. They have these individual projects that they undertake, whether it's a business, a nonprofit, um, whatever it is, right? It's something that they did and were challenged along the way and they overcame those challenges. So questions one and two are about your potential, right? Because colleges can only, they, they take a bet on you, right? They make a guess, they can only extrapolate based on what they know on your profile. Um, so the third question is kind of what ties everything together, right? It's going to be the why. Why does a student have these motivations? So are you authentic? Um, and that could be a little bit of a vague word sometimes, I feel. But what, what authenticity at least means to me and the students I work with is that, you know, do they have a genuine desire driven by their own inner thoughts, feelings, and character to really maximize their potential, to really go out and do those meaningful things and to make sure they're succeeding academically because they have a higher goal, right? They want to make an impact and they want to follow with what they're truly passionate about. I mean, I'll ask students sometimes as like a, a brainstorming question. Sometimes when we're talking about essays, like, what do you find yourself Googling in your spare time? Like, I know myself, I'm always like, just, I have a thought pop of my head and I'm on like Wikipedia, like a random person or bug, whatever it is. I'm, I'm a total nerd. Right. And if I see a student like that, that tells me that they just have this intense curiosity. Right. But it has to be genuine. Right. What comes across as not genuine is sort of what I mentioned before, when students just join all these different clubs just to participate. They do the things just because their parents told them to or just because their peers are doing it, not because they feel it carries any true meaning for them. And authenticity is not going to come out 
on a resume necessarily. Um, it's more going to come out in the essays and especially interviews, because I'm, I'm sure you have all had the experience of having a conversation with somebody who is just so passionate about what they do that it's just oozing out of their pores and they can't stop talking about it, right? These are the students that these Ivy League schools want. They want students who are interesting. Um, and, and I've heard that quote before. I have a, a friend who does interviews for Harvard and I've asked him like, hey, what's Harvard looking for these days? Like, what do you like to see in a student? And what he told me word for word was, we want to put together the most interesting dinner party. Like they want to bring together a group of students who are gonna sit around a table and just like talk at length on so many topics and in, in such depth that like the restaurant is closing around them and have to kick them out, right? Just total immersion. Um, and where does authenticity come from is kind of the big question, but it's about your experiences. Again, if, if you know more of what you're getting into and you do more research on it and you have more experience, then you have more to go off of, more to think about, more curiosity to drive you. So it really has to come from within. You know, and we're talking about, again, the top tier of students. If you're just a medium driven student, most colleges would love to have you, right? Assuming you meet their academic minimum. But when we're talking about those highly selective schools, again, they need students who are going to go above and beyond to really reach the highest potential, to really take advantage of all opportunities that are presented to them. So kind of an overview again, you have to reveal your character and through the different parts of your application, your academic potential, you know, what are you going to do that's meaningful beyond the classroom? And then how authentic, you know, what is your level of true desire to maximize what opportunities you have to really grow into your full potential? Those are kind of the big three. So how do you get there? So I've talked about this a little bit throughout this presentation, right? So critical thinking. So you can see a topic, understand a topic, think about how you can have an impact on this topic, right? How can you go out into this medical field and make a difference? How can you innovate technology that will keep people safer, right? You're, that you're constantly thinking about the big questions associated with your interest. Self-awareness goes into that because knowing what truly drives you uh, is really important in actually going out and deciding what to do. And I do a lot of that with my students is just helping them increase that self-awareness. I ask them lots and lots and lots of questions of, you know, especially when they're deciding, hey, what do I want to major in? Um, often the conversation comes down to, well, let's look at everything you've done so far and everything you, you know, what does this look like? Like a, a great example is a student I had um, this past year, but a few years ago when I started working with him, he was really undecided and, and couldn't decide between engineering or business. And I had him essentially create his resume, right? Write down everything he's done, the books he reads outside of class, everything that would go into his profile, and then pretend he's a college admissions officer and ask, you know, what do you think this student would major in? And ultimately he looked at all of his activities and interests and was like, oh yeah, I do want to study business. So, so having that awareness of where your motivations are leading you is really important because you want to be able to communicate that awareness, especially when it comes to essays, like why do you want to go to the school or why do you want to study this particular major? Having very specific driven goals in mind is really going to help convince the committee that you know exactly what you're doing. Um, making these important associations, that's similar to critical thinking, right? Taking the maybe diverse topic areas and finding how you can interrelated them together, you know, a group of people and what the problems are that they face and how we can link them together. And then communicating, of course, is going to be part of the application, right? The essays, the interviews, written speaking, communication. But overall, right, how a student communicates just in terms of their emotional intelligence, I think is really important. You know, what are their relationships like with their teachers, with their peers, uh, teachers are going to write recommendation letters. Counselors are going to write recommendation letters. Oftentimes, if they are doing projects outside of school, those professors or other individuals will be writing recommendation letters. So how well do you communicate with adults, right, and show that you are a mature, put-together student is also going to factor in in the end as well. So these skills overall tie into right, your desire, your authenticity, and overall how much you can show 
what you're thinking and feeling as well. Ultimately, I think that this is somewhat of a sales and marketing process on the student's behalf, right? Because when you fill out the application, you're, you're selling yourself, right? And so if any of you work in sales, you know that, you know, it's, it's the story you tell that really convinces that client that you are, you know, the product, the service that they really need. And so that's kind of what it is to students too. The more that they can create a connection um, and frankly, a human connection to that committee member, right? I mean, they're they're not going to see each other. Even interviews, admissions officers don't usually do them. Um, they're usually alumni. So how can they, how can a student convey their humanity and be able to connect with that admissions officer is really important as well, because that's how that the admissions officer can think, oh, I can really visualize this student in this school. So I was asked to compile a few case studies as some examples. Um, so I'm going to go through just a few of them. These are some students that we worked with, and I tried to keep them all from a similar background. So I know a lot of people um, joining this presentation are from the Edison area. So I picked some students who were from the Edison area um, and attended some of the competitive high schools in the area, went to highly selective colleges, just so you guys can get a taste of what these high-level students are doing. So just kind of breeze through a few of them. So first student accepted to Princeton um, was the valedictorian, number one in the class, and had a very high SAT score, but not a perfect score, not a 1600. Took 10 AP classes, so a very rigorous curriculum. Uh, and what made this student stand out was their academic drive. So they took classes at Princeton while they were still in high school. So they were either duly enrolled or just took classes like over the summer outside of class. Um, the research projects that they had, they did multiple research projects with multiple professors starting really early. Um, they wrote papers, they submitted those papers. So they really dug into that area of interest and their letters of recommendation were from those research professors who could attest to the quality of the work that the student did. And I think one of the biggest thing that made them stand out was that they got so good at assisting these professors with research that they, as a high schooler, were training the professor's graduate students on the research methods. So it really went above and beyond in their participation, you know, showing that they really can be a leader and again, this is something completely outside of school. This wasn't a club. This was just something that the student took the initiative and emailed all these professors to try to find one that in the area of study that they were interested in and got to the point where they were like training grad students as a high schooler. That's like, I feel like Princeton looked at this and was like, wow, like you're going to come to Princeton and you're going to be training grad students as well, right? Can see the potential. Um I also want to show you some excerpts of the essays as well, and, and that's kind of a whole other presentation, but again, just to show you that written communication is really important, and uh, I'll kind of give you a moment to read through this on your own. I don't have to read off the slide, um, but what you'll see here is, you know, very distinct language, you know, very um, descript language, right, and the topic is about his garden but relating his garden to ancient history and like historical figures and all back to a main idea of connecting to community. So it wasn't about his research project, right? There is space on the application to talk about research projects that you've done, but I think the essay is a really important component in showing off back to the student's character and that they are more than just what's on paper, but the way that they interact with people. Um, so I thought this was pretty, pretty cool excerpt. So I'll give you a couple more seconds just to get a sense of this. I think another thing that stands out for the student is, you know, this line, I discovered the answer to a question is often simply another question. That also shows his intellectual curiosity, right? which I mentioned a couple of times that students who are genuinely have this thirst for knowledge. I mean, what is the purpose of a university but to create new knowledge through research and to teach that knowledge to students through classes, right? So knowledge is the foundation. So students who show that intellectual curiosity uh, above and beyond are, are desirable for colleges. 
So let's take a look at another student. This is a student who went to Brown um, on their BSMD program. So not only got into a highly selective university, but like the most selective program at this highly selective university. I mean, BSMD programs have admit rates that are below 1%. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. Um, so this student, again, very good academics, pretty much almost, you know, perfect ACT score, almost perfect SAT score, highly ranked, lots of AP classes, and they're interested in medicine, right? So they had to show that through their profile. So they shadowed, shadowed doctors, volunteered at a hospital and a clinic. But again, lots of students shadow doctors, lots of students volunteered hospitals. So what else you got to go above and beyond? So they wrote this pamphlet about a health condition that they distributed out to patients. Um, again, volunteered, Again, I would say that's like mid-level, but was a varsity athlete, so showing that they can handle a rigorous schedule. Uh, the Congressional Gold Award is a very high accomplishment that basically Congress bestows upon a student who's made large impacts in their community, and also showed that they could thrive under challenges, so future business leaders of America, second place. And, and you'll notice that's not really related to medicine. That's business, right? But it's something that the student clearly enjoyed doing and was good at and stuck with it. So this is an example of a student who's a little bit diverse. You got the sports, the business, but also the medicine, but clearly is successful in everything that they do. Um, the summer research projects and the one that stands out also is the, the international collaboration, I believe, um, with the research center in Israel that resulted in the discovery of a new nucleotide. So that's pretty cool. Again, I imagine Brown looked at that and was like, all right, so this student is involved in very high level research and discovering new things. Like, that's amazing. Um, and also an EMT. So some of the stuff on this, right, I would say, you know, the shadowing, the volunteering, being an EMT, being an athlete, this is all great stuff. And that's, this is what I would expect to see from a highly qualified student. But what really makes the student stand out are those independent projects, like creating the pamphlet, the research projects, and the fact that they have shown success in multiple areas. Uh, and here's a couple of excerpts out of this student's essay as well um, about empathy. So not as colorful language as the previous essay, and, you know, not every student needs to be a Pulitzer Prize winning creative writer, um, but it's really more about what character traits show through the essays. I mean, colleges understand that they're, these are 17, 18 year olds, right? So they, they don't have the expectation that it's going to be a mind blowing writing quality, but it has to has to show the student. So this one talks about her empathy and how they advocate for those who are reluctant to use their voices. So traits that are highly desirable in the medical field is empathy, right? So character traits that you display in your essay, it's a good idea to pick ones that would show, um, you know, predict success in the field that you would like to go into. So our third student here got into Cornell, again, high GPA, um, above the average um, or the highest level for that school, 1540 SAT, so not perfect, but still pretty high, and multiple leadership positions, right, so showing that they have a variety of interests, but, you know, seem to be more robotics coding, like engineering side of things, but also a musician, and, you know, produces their own music, taught piano, so again, is maximizing their potential in that area, doesn't just take piano lessons, but kind of went above and beyond and did their own creative activities, interned at multiple companies, participated in, so the competitive business leadership program. So those are like summer programs that you have to apply to get into. And so participated in a few of those. So already showed their academic potential. Um, this one also took courses outside of high school at top universities online. So back to the intellectual curiosity component, you know, really dove in and did something extra. Lots of volunteering, and so their essay, I, I didn't actually have excerpts from these essays. I, I collected these from a variety of our counselors. Um, but this essay that a student wrote, um, I was told was about cooking, being like engineering and how they like to share new recipes with friends and community members. So they related something unrelated to their profile, right? Cooking, they're not interested in culinary school, but it's something that they like to do. 
but they did relate it to something they want to study, engineering. So how the, you know, different ingredients were inputs and how there was a process and output, you know, probably discussed in systems terms. And then also that larger impact. Um, I think uh, a personal project of, of this student was that they created a recipe book for their neighborhood and not just a recipe book, but also did research into the origins of the recipe, like the anthropology of the ingredients or where they came from. And so it was more than just, you know, hey, neighbor, how do you make your pizza? You know, it was really like a collection of, of stories in a way that relate to food. So again, went above and beyond and just did this because they like cooking. It was just for fun and had nothing to do with robotics, right? But that, again, shows the authenticity of that student as well, that they're not trying to pigeonhole themselves into a certain area. And then one more student, um, again, high GPA, but not perfect, high SAT score, but not perfect. Only five AP classes, which is about half of the previous students that you saw, but still quite rigorous. Um, and, you know, once you take more than five AP classes, I, I, I don't think it makes a huge difference. Um, as long as you're, again, showing that you can handle rigorous courses. So, you know, the difference between five and eight is kind of minimal. Um, but the students show they had multiple leadership positions, multiple organizations they were a tutor with. A uh, Civil Air Patrol cadet, I think, was something cool and unique that stuck out to the student. So, you know, participating in a public organization that supports national security, like they teach kids how to fly, which I think is super cool um member of multiple honor societies so clearly show the academic component they were taking challenging courses already so that's a common theme with these students too right taking classes outside of school at a higher level and then this student's independent projects were they started a chapter of an education nonprofit, and so it was an organization that already existed but they took the initiative to start a local chapter and then also had an independent project where they collected bikes from around town and repaired them and then donated them to the boys and girls clubs. So you can see, yeah, strong academics, but not the most strong compared to the other students, but had these really strong projects that were really impactful on their community, um, as well as showing their, you know, civic duty and that they had the ability to lead multiple operations. So as you can see, you don't necessarily have to be perfect, but this student's character really showed through everything else that they did. And they went to Cornell. So that's sort of the end of my part of the presentation. Um, so now I would like to get to the questions. So I have a couple of QR sure. codes. I'll, I'll leave this one up um, if you guys want to click on some links, but yeah, so I I just heard a voice appear. Oh, that's Hello. Kim. That's Kim. <laughs> so I, I was keeping up with the questions that were coming in, and I tried to kind of group them up a little bit. Sure. So I'm going to hit on extracurriculars, and you, I think you may have touched upon some of these, but we can certainly um, maybe expand. So there's three that came up. Do you need to win awards in your extracurricular activities? Um, the other one was about passion projects and how do you show evidence? And then- Let's, let's go one at a time. Yeah. Well, well I, I didn't know to. how many of them may have intertwined, so. Yeah, well, well. Um, are you looking at the, the chat box here? Yeah, so, so do you have to win? That was the first question, right? Do you have to win things? Um, winning's great. Um, but winning isn't always something that is dependent on one student, right? So if you participate in something that is a group effort, you know, I don't think a college will necessarily judge you for not winning, right? Um, but it looks good, right? As you can see, a couple of the students did participate in competitions and win something. So, you know, I'm not going to say that it doesn't matter, right? But it certainly helps, I guess. Um, there, there's so many different factors that go in with extracurriculars, right? I mean, if you have a lot of other things in your profile, is what I'm saying, that that balance out the fact that you didn't win that competition, then all will still be good. So I think that answers that. Um, okay. And then what was the next one? So how important are passion projects and how do you make sure that admissions professionals see the evidence of the projects that are non-traditional? How important are passion projects? I would say for highly selective admissions, they are 
very important because um, it goes back to showing, you know, will the student do meaningful things with their life, right? They're already doing meaningful things. They're taking initiative. They're taking things that they're curious about and they're doing something about it. Um, it's something I tell my students all the time is that, you know, any anybody can be an activist, right? Anybody can repost stuff on social media. Anybody can talk about an issue, right? But talking about problems doesn't do much, right? What actions are you actually taking? What steps are you taking that will go towards helping to alleviate whatever this situation is? Um, so I think passion projects are super important. If you want any shot at the, the IV tier that you have to be developing these, these independent projects. And in terms of proof, um, some schools have portfolios like MIT in particular, they have a maker portfolio where you can send pictures and stuff of things that you've done. Um, but there's also an opportunity at a lot of schools to attach a resume. And so I don't encourage my students all to write resumes because often they're very redundant with what's in the activities list, except if they do any of these special projects, having a, a separate document that can showcase more details of this project and go a little more depth, you know, maybe attach some pictures, kind of the same thing as a portfolio. That's an opportunity. And if there isn't a portfolio, if there isn't somewhere to attach a resume, there still is the activities list itself. Um, although your description is limited for that. So there's also an additional info box on the Common App where that's where I would say is the, the sort of last plan if the other plans don't work that a student can really expound on what they did and if they want to include links to a website or something um, there's no guarantee that an admissions officer will look at it but you can certainly um, look at the links I mean they'll, they'll look at the additional info but but yeah there's definitely multiple opportunities to show what they've done Excellent. So the third was, um, would you rather have a student who has a very versatile extracurriculars and academics or a student who grinds on their one or two interests? So depth versus breadth. Um, ideally both, <laughs> but I think depth is more important than breadth because again, it goes back into how motivated you are to really maximize your opportunities and your potential in a certain area. You know, if you're just participating in a lot of different things, right? But kind of the examples I showed of students though, were, you know, they were leaders in multiple clubs. So I think that's definitely a selling point is if you do have a variety of interests and you can grind on those variety of interests. But if, you know, your bandwidth is limited and you can only grind on a few, I would much rather you grind on a few than not grind on any of them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> um, if you, oh, wait, hold on. Um, how does the overall difficulty of a high school, not a student's course load, but the high school itself, like the ranking, factor into the college admissions process? So sort of, but not really. Um, so a highly competitive, Uh oh. Nikki just froze. Hold on a second. Hmm. To the STEM schools that you have to. Hey, Nikki, you froze. Oh, oh, geez. Am I back now? Yes, we're, we're, but I'm not, I didn't hear any of that answer. So oh. you might need to go back to the beginning of the, okay. um, the ranking, school rank. Uh, yeah, so, okay, dialing back. So there are uh, two kinds of competitive high schools in my mind. There's ones that you have to apply to get into, and then there's ones that just happen to be competitive because of the neighborhood, right? So the ones where you have to apply to get into it, you already have shown that you have that sort of academic potential. And I think what happens at those schools, um, you're kind of held to a little bit of a higher standard. So if you're in this competitive school, you already got in, you, you applied, you're in this like, you know, make like a special technology program, colleges are going to expect that you continue to excel there, I guess. Like if you get into this Is that school, like a magnet school. Yeah, it could be a magnet school. I'm thinking of um, like I have a, a student this year at um, Thomas Jefferson High School for Science Technology, and that's in the, the um 
DMV, um, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Um, and it's a very, very competitive school. Um, but, you know, once you get there, if you're sort of on the bottom tier of those students, not necessarily going to help you that much. Um, but at the end of the day, right, you are compared to students in your school, right? You're not compared, New Jersey kids aren't being compared to kids in Kentucky. You just can't because the context is completely different. So what matters is how much are you succeeding within your peer group? How much are you taking advantage of the opportunities that are presented to you, right? So a school in central New Jersey that offers 30 AP classes, right? They're going to want to see students taking those, you know, five to 10 AP classes versus a kid who goes to a school in rural Kentucky that only offers two AP classes, you know, maybe they're going to expect the student to only have taken one of them, right? But in the minds of the admissions committee, these are both students who are maximizing their opportunities. So it matters and it doesn't matter. And where I think it gets a little difficult at, you know, the more competitive schools is the fact that you are being compared to your peers, right? So it's more difficult to stand out if everyone is doing all the things, um, which is why when we talk about the character side of things, it's so important because a school like J.P. Stevens, everybody's getting really good SAT scores. Everybody is getting, you know, GPAs that are above, well above average. So what else are they doing that's standing out? And that's where these independent projects, I think, can really come into play because there's so much competition for the leadership spot in the robotics club, right? Everybody wants to be president. Only one person can per year, or maybe there's co-presidents now. But regardless, those opportunities are, there's more competition for them. So the things that you can create on your own are going to matter more. Hopefully that's kind of covered it. So what, it, I think you mentioned this earlier, but which is more important, a high GPA or high AP test scores? Um, so AP scores are not necessarily being considered for admission. Like they are a little bit now um, because the SAT sub subject test went away. Um, getting good grades in your AP classes, I think, are important because AP tests don't happen until May. So like, let's say you're taking the bulk of your AP classes your senior year, a college won't know those scores before they decide on you. So GPA is going to matter most. Um, AP scores matter when you want to try to get credit later on in college, but I don't think it's the biggest decision factor. Definitely not more than GPA, um, just based on the fact that colleges don't even see those scores until after you've been admitted. Okay. And what like, about we'll put some on the application, but if you take it senior year, they won't see it later. Yeah. Right. So if you did not start high school in the US, so your the GPAs are different, how do you how do you dive in? How do you make up for that? Or how do you highlight your academics then? Uh I think that's a very case-by-case -case basis. Uh depends on when a student came over to the US. Like if they have two years of grades in the U.S., and that's probably what the college is going to look at. Um, if they transfer really late, like in their senior year, sometimes, sometimes colleges will want to see transcripts from the prior high school, and sometimes it has to go through, like, you know, it has to be translated or notarized. It really depends on, like, you know, what, what country. Was it an international school? Was it not? You know, I think there's just a lot of factors involved in that. Um, but if you graduate from a school in the U.S., you should have grades from a school in the U.S., and um, they will use that primarily for the determination, along with any other information that comes internationally. Excellent. So there's um, a, a little bit of a different process for international students. Yeah. 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 Um, so going back to what you had said about the AP classes, should you take your AP classes in junior year or keep it for senior year? As soon as you feel like you can handle the rigor and definitely be leveling up in your classes each year. Like you don't want to take, you know, AP English or junior year and then go back down to honors English or senior year because that's going to throw up a flag and they're going to be like, well, 
why? Why are you not challenging yourself as much? So, so regardless of when you start, because sometimes, you know, let's say for a, a math track, maybe you don't get to pre-calc until junior year because of wherever you started. So you can only take AP Calc your senior year, but it's still going to be shown as you're increasing your rigor each year. So that's sort of the, the, the rule of thumb there is to always be increasing whenever you start. Okay, so don't hold off to senior year so you don't have to show the test scores. Yeah, no, and and you don't have to submit AP scores. Mm -hmm. So, um, And taking APs in sophomore year would be a good idea too if you felt, as you were just saying, that you can handle the, the rigor and um, it's a progression for them. Yes, exactly. If, if you feel that you can handle the course load and you'll get an A or a B plus, you know, maybe a B, you know, but if you're going to be failing these classes, then we don't want that. So definitely keep keep in mind what you can handle as a student and also make sure that you're not sacrificing time that you would use to develop other parts of your profile, like those projects and the extracurriculars and everything else, right? I mean, colleges and, and selective colleges, they don't want to see students who are purely academics and nothing else. So if starting sophomore year would interfere with your ability to develop other parts of your profile, I would argue to hold off. Um, because like I said, once you take five, six APs, you're showing rigor. You know, um, you don't have to take 10, 12. You know, I, I think, I think you know, six is a fine number. Um, again, as long as you're showing increasing rigor over time and it's balanced. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go back to an international student again. So is there any advice um, in terms of scholarships, aids, you know, um, the admissions process, probably, I think you said the admissions process and the prep is probably a little bit more customized to individuals, but anything as far as scholarships and aids for international students? Well, the thing with an international student is, uh, and, and I see this question here too, so, so student living in the U.S., going to school in the U.S., but legally international. Um, again, obviously the transcript would be U.S., but since you're not a citizen and you're not qualified for any federal aid, right? So you can't really expect to get as much in terms of scholarships. Um, scholarships for international students are less common than they are for citizens. Um, so it will be a little bit more difficult um, from the financial perspective. Um, but in terms of admission process, all that is gonna be all the same if the student went to high school in the US. Um, if they didn't, then it's a matter again of, of possibly having to translate and and if, you know make official transcripts and those sorts of things and and making sure that counselor letters and teacher letters are in English and all that sort of thing. Um, but if we're just talking strictly from a, a citizenship standpoint, um, but the student is in the US, all the other factors are going to be the same. It's just the financing might be a little bit different. So, and um, we work with students on when they're developing their college list to help them take that into consideration, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, another college list question. Is there a list of colleges that um, may be more friendly for students that are in a, um, a, on, a on a spectrum or that are maybe... Um, have learning disabilities or just different mm -hmm. yeah no there, there are definitely a bunch of colleges that are more tuned into that type of student um, i typically recommend smaller colleges for these students because they're more tight-knit communities it's it's less easy for them to sort of slip through the cracks but even at larger universities um, a lot of them have specific programs that you can enroll in that are supportive of students with learning differences as well that might offer extra academic coaching or tutoring or note taking sort of like all the accommodations that you might be used to in high school so even if it is a bigger school they might have an uh, office dedicated to that and there are smaller schools that are more geared towards those types of students too so yep it's out there 
Okay. Um, I think that we're almost finished. There's one more, but if anyone else has any questions, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A as, uh, as I present the last question that we've gotten so far. So extracurriculars. Do you think that your love of animals and volunteering around that will help also? Yeah. And again, it also depends on how in depth you go, right? I mean, if you're just volunteering at the shelter and walking dogs, that's one thing, right? But if you're creating an initiative to, you know, have public adoption days or, you know, bringing groups together to, you know, have the elementary school kids read to the dogs, or if you're creating public awareness campaigns and, or on, you know, animal abuse and presenting in front of your local town council. I mean, there are levels of engagement here, right? And one is just saying, oh, I love puppies, right? But everybody loves puppies, right? But what else are you doing beyond that that's really having an impact on your community? And that's going to be the differentiating factor. Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. Um, so I know that you have some closing comments. One of the things I just wanted to mention real quick is when you finish up the um, the webinar, there's a couple of survey questions at the end that I'd love for um, folks to just take a, a few moments to answer. They're really quick and easy, but um, the feedback will be really valuable. And then I turn it back to you. Yeah. So um, again, if you have any other questions, pop them in the box, pop them in the chat. I'll, I can hang out for a few more minutes to talk. And um, up on this current slide is also a link to contact us if you'd like to get a more specific consultation related to your situation. Um, we offer those free of charge, so just sign up and you can get in contact with our office about that. Um, but yeah, I believe that you'll all get an email with a, a possible link to this afterwards. Um, I know there are a lot of people that signed up that didn't make it, so hopefully we can get the word out to them as well. But Overall, I appreciate you all coming, and these are some really great questions. Hopefully, I clarified um, some things. And we have yeah. another one popped up, Nikki. Yes, yes. So, any suggestions for neurodivergent applicants? Um, yeah. So, similar to I guess what I said about the, the the list, right? There are schools out there who are more supportive of it, and. I, I'm guessing you're asking more of what they can be doing right now, right? Because they wouldn't really, you know, if they're neurodivergent, it might be harder for you to participate in all these activities at a significant depth, right? And that is something that, you know, one, we tailor the list more fine-tuned to take that into consideration. And back to the additional info section, you know, if you want a chance to sort of explain, you know, if you have, for example, like sensory um, sensitivities and like loud noises really make you anxious. And that's sort of why you don't really go out and do big group things. You know, if, if you feel comfortable explaining that, um, a college might be, you know, more understanding and it might add some context into, you know, why the student go, didn't go to the pep rallies and, and, you know, all those sorts of things. So uh, it goes back to authenticity, you know, and I think especially with those who are neuro neurodivergent, whether it's ADD or autism or whatever it might be, um, being true to what they need, because um, it's it's hard to be neurodivergent in a neurotypical world. And I think that owning the fact that their minds work a little bit differently and highlighting the ways that they've been able to adapt, but also um, I know lots of people on the spectrum and with ADHD, they do have very specific interests that they do like to get into. And so still feeling like it's important to highlight you know, whatever it is, it doesn't, again, have to be academic, like the student who wrote about cooking, right? I mean, that had nothing related to anything on the profile. So just um, still having the confidence to know that what you do matters to colleges and they want to hear about it. Yep. Terrific. Thank you. And for anyone who may have missed it, we will be sending out the recording. So uh, keep an eye on your email for that. And Nikki, um, you got lots of compliments on how informative this has been and how valuable. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Very glad to be here. And, you know, maybe we'll be doing another one soon if there's interest. I know uh, Anita, I talked about that. Um, I can do another presentation about how to build a college list. We can go more in depth into these different factors. Oh. 
Um, we could do something on writing essays. I mean, there, there's so many different topics that we could cover. So, you know, if you guys in the audience have any feedback on anything else you would love to have a presentation on, it's just a matter of setting a date and sending out links and we can make it happen. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'll hang out a little bit longer if anybody else has questions, but thank you all for coming. Feel free to check us out. Got some links to click on. Um, go back to the other slide. Um, we have a newsletter if you want to subscribe to that with all sorts of fun information. And also we have our probability calculator at the bottom of this slide if you're interested in seeing where your student stacks up. Yeah, Nikki, there's been a couple of blog articles recently about, you know, how many APs I should take or um, whether it's, uh, you know, better to get an A in a AP mm -hmm. class or, or I said it backwards, but, um, yes. <laughs> and about extracurricular activities and balancing your, the amount of time that you have to dedicate towards it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all about balance in the end. So um, some awesome blog articles to help support some of the questions that were asked today. Awesome. Yeah. Good info. Great. Well, I'm going to hang out as long as people are here. So you are welcome to go back to dinner or hang out and ask more questions. Or if you want to get on, I don't know how I could let people chat i guess we could allow them to be on video or something somehow um, if you yeah. want to speak you can um at this point like raise your hand and i can um yeah allow you in if this were in person this would be the uh, after dinner drinks right <laughs> i do miss in-person seminars for that we can all mingle a little bit more but hey we got to do what we can do great to have another session on an essay on essays sure yeah we can do an essay presentation yeah, Anita. Yeah, I have a question. A um, lot of uh, students pay money, like, you know, many of these summer courses in Ivy Leagues, right? Or many good colleges, $1,000, $2,000. Many of them are really, really expensive for many parents. And they keep approaching uh, many of us asking, you know, is it really worth paying that money? Because it's a lot of money for a parent you know, as it is to put kids to college. Yeah. So does this really enhance the resume uh, application saying, you know, I paid $2,000. It's good to have, not not bad, but, you know, in what to say, uh, uh, one of the, uh, like Harvard has got a pre-summer course for $4,000. MIT has got $5,000. So is it, yeah. is it worth uh, paying that money and, you know doing it or uh, yeah. or uh, what is the weightage uh, an admission officer gives to those kind of programs yeah yeah so i would say it depends on it depends on a couple things um so one would be like the case studies i talked about students took actual college courses at these college it wasn't just a summer program right and obviously okay. if you're taking a class at a college you have to pay for the credits right yeah. so something like that is definitely showing intellectual curiosity you know high willingness to challenge yourself with rigor so that's pretty cool um and there are certain summer programs that you know you have to apply for and be like a certain standard for um like uh, i know mit participates in like summer science um or so, so summer scholars program or science scholar i forget what the acronym ssp i forget what it stands for yes. um but but so something like that where you have to apply and it's rigorous to get accepted um and yes you might have to pay a little bit of tuition and fees so those are the ones that i think would make you stand out more now just like the regular old you know just pay the money and you're there um, I think it's a good experience, right? It shows, you know, gives students a taste of college life, but huh. will it make or break a college application? Probably not, right? And okay. and it all depends on where it all fits into the rest of what the student does, right? I mean, is the student already doing research at this university and uses this program as a chance to visit and meet the professor, right? You know, like there's subtle factors that go into it as well. But I would say just those pay to play programs in and of themselves don't necessarily mean something because yes, right? It just means that you can pay for it. Right, right, right. 
And this Princeton dual, uh, is that dual program or anybody from any county or any school can apply for those classes, courses? Uh, like, uh, at Princeton yeah. University itself? Yeah, um, you said high school students can apply. Uh, anybody from uh, New Jersey or New York can apply for those school for those classes. You know, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I think P Peter, are you still here? He's our our founding partner, and he <laughs> might know that because he lives in Princeton, and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought, yeah, let me let me unmute you, Peter. Are you around? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Um, hi, Anita. Um, you know, the issue is going to be one of convenience. You know, the reason why most of the students uh, are local and taking courses at Princeton is because they can get from, let's say, Princeton High School, you know, over to the university quickly and easily because it happens during the school day most of the time. Right. Cool day. Okay. okay. Right. Okay. And so you just you're not going to see it from schools that are a little, little bit further afield, but you can. There's nothing preventing you from doing it other than the <laughs> logistics and the lack yeah. of convenience. Correct. 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 But usually yeah. uh, the reason I ask is because dual enrollment, if at all, is given to that county school. It's like you're in Mercer County, so you get to do dual enrollment. Princeton schools get to do dual enrollment with Princeton University. We get to do dual enrollment with Middlesex County College. So that's why I Correct. wanted to know, is that a dual enrollment or anything? No, is it it's, open? It's, not, it's not dual enrollment. It's just students taking individual classes okay. that are offering subjects that exceed the highest levels of classes that are available at the high school. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Quite welcome. Yeah. And Peter, these students aren't like, they don't become Princeton University students. They don't have to apply, but it's more like auditing the classes, right? Or they, they're getting Princeton oh, University. They're getting credit for, for these they classes are. towards huh. their high school diploma. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But they still have to apply to get to take them then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So there is a bit of a selection process involved, which I think is what Anita was also asking about. Yeah. No. Yeah. So if there's a student that's in, interested in law and there's no specific undergraduate law classes, other than internships, what else can help to make a good resume? Um, so I think they're asking, you know, what to do as an undergraduate, I'm assuming, versus a high schooler. Um, but, you know, law schools look for somebody who's civically involved. Um, so, you know, student council, all that sort of thing, you know, a community leader. Um, definitely internships, but yeah, doing really well in any uh, writing associated classes. Um, and th there are some undergraduate like law classes that aren't like law school classes, but certainly have, you know, legal or political or policy themes to them. So those are certainly opportunities. And uh, what I would suggest for any high schoolers interested in law are some really good extracurriculars or like debate or mock trial, right? Anything that's getting them practicing their public speaking and their logical arguments. Uh, those are really good experiences to have. Excellent. Thanks, Nikki. Mm -hmm. I think I saw a few more things, but do colleges consider accelerated courses in high school? I think that's what we were just talking about. Um, like accelerated courses, meaning like AP? or just above honors level? I mean, just above honors. So there's, some, I think that there's accelerated and then there's also yeah. AP, so. Yeah, it, each high school kind of names things differently as well. Um, but I guess my answer to this question is, is when a college looks at a student's transcript, right? They wanna see that they are taking as rigorous, as hard classes as they can. So they, they consider all of the classes. There are no classes that are not considered. It's more of the overall transcript and how does it show, the, you know, again, the student leveling up it each year um, and taking challenging courses. Like if they're at just regular level and getting all A's, that's not gonna be as meaningful as if they were in like an accelerated honors and AP and getting all A's. So like the 4.0 versus 4.0, I 
the number sort of changes based on how rigorous a transcript is or the meaning of that number anyway. So I hope that answered that question. All right, I think that we might have exhausted the question. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to hang on until everybody wants to leave. So just in case. <laughs> but thank you all. Uh, yeah, Kim posted that that blog post in the chat. So if you want to check that out. Um, yes, there's a survey when the when you leave the um, when you exit the chat. Uh, yeah, the webinar. Yeah. So when you leave the webinar, there should be a survey at the end. Um, if not, please feel free to email us at college at princetoncollegeconsulting.net. Thanks for coming, John. I just saw John mm -hmm. this morning at networking. Ah. All right. Well, seems like we're done. So Kim, I'll let you stop the recording when you want. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.